wonderful introduction. Um, I'm glad we have this history. Um, it's always great to hear this. Uh, um, I also want to thank all the organizers for putting together such a fabulous conference. Um, today, amongst many other things, I want us to rethink um, everything that we've been told about new media. In fact, I want us to reject all that crap about the viral, about disruption, um, about the instantaneous. Um, and I want to do so for many reasons, um, too many to get into today. Apparently, it takes at least three books and a couple edited collections to even start. Um, but most basically, I want us to look askew at the new um, because the new, the disruptive, um, they're smoke screens. And obsessing about what lies on the bleeding edge of obsolescence, obsessing about the instantaneous, blinds us to the ways in which things remain. Um, when, how things remain, especially when we think they're obsolete. Um, especially when we think they're part of the past. Um, so they blind us to the ways in which things remain in and through our infrastructures, in and through our muscle memory. Um, it blinds us to the way in which, in fact, we embody the obsolete. Um, so the past lives on a temporally, um, habitually, through our personal actions and choices. And to make this point, today I'm going to focus on the bizarre feedback loop between virtual and physical segregation, um, on what we might only, if we're extremely disingenuous, extremely disingenuous, call racism 2.0. Um, because if we face this today, um, it's because racism and inequality, they've never gone away. So it should be no surprise that we're that they're embedded in our network algorithms. Um, but my point isn't simply that we shouldn't be surprised. My point is that if we want to move beyond congratulating ourselves for not being surprised, um, as if this was, again, some kind of accomplishment, um, we need to engage network science and algorithms. We need to imagine new defaults, new modes of connection. We need to dwell in the space between model and reality to realize that political agency, political agency lies in that gap. Um, more importantly, we need to realize that if networks segregate, it's because society is still segregated. Um, because even the most liberal of societies have been lush hosts for the weeds of fascism. Um, so Milton Friedman, who on so many levels was and is wrong, um, was also right. Um, and you'll see here that he, he doesn't talk about disruption or crisis or the, the need to produce these. What he emphasizes are the seeds of the habitual. Um, and what we need to realize is that these seeds aren't simply the platform for future um, improbabilities, which is the way he frames it here, but rather also um, the weeds of the past. OK, um, so part one, machine learning, money laundering for bias. Um, so recently, Pinboard tweeted the following. Uh, machine learning is like money laundering for bias. Um, and as you'll see, it's been retweeted over a thousand times. Um, and it's been retweeted so much because it rather brilliantly encapsulates a lot of the suspicions we have um, about the neutrality and efficacy about um, big data or data-driven algorithms. Um, from the disaster that is Facebook's trending, right? So Facebook. Um, fired all of its human editors um, last year um, because they were allegedly biased. Um, they allegedly um, and deliberately censored conservative news. This led, as the Guardian here reports, who um, apparently is the propagator of fake news, um, in the algorithms going crazy. Um, so among the top stories were a fake story about Megyn Kelly being um, fired by Fox News after she said she would support Hillary Clinton, as well as a real video of a man masturbating with a McDonald's sandwich. Right? This is Facebook. They censored breastfeeding photos, right? Um, 
That same week, in August, a coalition of civil liberties and civil rights organizations issued a statement against predictive policing technologies. And so according to these folks, these algorithms were poisoned by the data, data provided by police um, themselves, um, that made these algorithms themselves biased. Um, these are just two of many. I'm sure you've heard of many others, including this study, which showed that um, a search on a black sound sounding name is 25% more likely to get an ad suggestive of a criminal record. Um, and revelations that the software used by some US courts to predict recidivism and thus actually to determine the sentencing and the parole of, of certain criminals, um, this is biased against racial minorities. Now, according to some, and this is clear from all these articles put together, um, the problem is bad data, right? What we need, therefore, is cleaner, better data, crime data scrubbed free of racial bias, um, more images of black folk in libraries, more diversity within the tech industry. Yes, absolutely. But, but, Better data won't solve this problem because it's not simply a question of whether things are included or excluded, but rather how things are included even when they're not. So you don't need to act to be captured. You don't need to act to register. Um, so consider uh, the Chicago police list, um, police hit list, heat, heat list, heat. Hit, same thing, okay. So um, to combat the growing um, homicide rate, uh, the Chicago police produced a list of the 400, um, what they deemed as the 400 people most likely to either be killed or to kill someone. Um, and then the police then visited uh, the top 20 um, and told them about their impending doom um, and tried to convince them to act otherwise. Like, clearly they had watched too much TV drama. This is persons of interest. Um, now, to come up with this heat list, the Chicago police didn't use overtly racist categories. They didn't consider race. Um, and they didn't just study people's actual behavior. Instead, they studied their social networks. Um, so they place people on the heat list, not based solely on what these people did, but rather on what their perceived network neighbors did. So because of their neighbors, they became persons of interest. Um, and what's important here is that uh, you'll notice here that in this description, um, Getting shot is talked about in the same terms as HIV, right? This is the problem with this logic of virality, right? Now, what we have to realize is that these networks are performative. Um, they create what they claim merely to describe um, and in non-obvious ways. So the heat list actually didn't reduce homicides, um, but it did lead to people who are on this list being 2.88 more times likely to be arrested for a shooting. Um, it also created suspicion around the target. So um, this is more anecdotal, but someone who was put on the heat list with a very um, light criminal record was afraid he'd be killed because they would think he was a police snitch. So networks, in other words, um, can become self-fulfilling prophecies. Um, and what we have to realize as well is in becoming self-fulfilling prophecies, they're also unverifiable. Right? So these, it's really hard to tell if and how accurate these networks are. Um, for instance, if you consider recommendation search engines, there's no way of knowing whether or not you would have bought that book anyway. Right? So these systems proliferate false positives. Right? Um, they're abstractions to produce authenticity, um, which brings me to part two, abstract authenticity. Okay. This is the longest section. Do not freak out if there's only five minutes left before we get to the third section. Okay, um, Okay. so very briefly, what is network science? 
Um, at the most basic level, network science captures, that is, analyzes, articulates, imposes, instrumentalizes, and elaborates upon connection. Um, described as fundamentally interdisciplinary, it basically brings together the quantitative social sciences with um, computer and physics. Now, the claims made on behalf of network science aren't modest. Um, so according to the acclaimed network scientist um, Barabasi, network science obviates the need for human psychology. Um, so in the past, if you wanted to understand what humans do and why they do it, you became a card-carrying psychologist. Today, you may want to obtain a degree in computer science. Um, this is because network science, combined with increasingly penetrating digital technologies, place us in an immense research laboratory that in size, complexity, and detail surpasses everything that science has encountered before. And this lab um, reveals, allegedly, the deep rhythms of life as evidence of a deeper order in human behavior, one that can be explored, predicted, and no doubt exploited. Um, so network science, in other words, um, unravels a vast collective non-conscious encased within the fishbowl of digital media, um, which is why I like to think of network science as the bastard child of psychoanalysis. Right? Because in the world of network science, there are no accidents. There are no slips of the tongue. Right? Every action is symptomatic. Every action reveals, that is, indicates a larger collective non-conscious pattern. Um, you can also view network science as a perverse form of what Fred Jameson once imagined as cognitive mapping. Um, but rather than a yet unimaginable form of political socialist art, which corresponds to the imperative to grow no, new organs, to expand our sensorium and our body to some new yet unimaginable, perhaps ultimately impossible dimensions, um, networks resolved um, postmodern confusion. They resolved that disparity between the authentic and the true by making the world the map by reducing authenticity to the authentication of systematic truths. So like the cognitive uh, mapping that Jameson imagined, network science lifts the fog of postmodern confusion, again, the disparity between the authentic and the true, um, but not by allowing us to grow these fantastic new organs or senses, but rather by contracting the world to the map. It forces a mode of authenticity shaped to artificially intelligent truths. It makes the world the lab. It's performative. It prescribes what it describes by merging us all into a monstrous chimera linked together via habits. And this monstrous um, mapping, this, this production, depends on almost cartoonish simplifications, which are then deemed universal. Um, so these discovered relations are vast simplifications of vast simplifications, with each phase of network theory producing abstractions which are then um, reinforced in the next stage. Um, so the first abstraction is applied or epistemological. It suggests or explains um, for given research domains how to abstract phenomena into networks. So it's how do you decide what's a node in an edge, right? The second, which is pure network theory, deals with formalized aspects of network representations. So in this stage, the corresponding theories are mathematical. Um, and at this stage, imitation is truth. Okay. Causality is whatever reproduces the abstractions that were produced in the first stage. Right. Um, and network science grounds network algorithms. It grounds recommendation systems, search engines, etc. And at the heart of network science is the principle of homophily. Um, and this is where the virtual and the physical, um, in terms of segregation, come to coincide. Now, homophily is the axiom that grounds um, social network analysis, and one would argue even all forms of network analysis. 
Um, and here you see a quotation um, taken from perhaps the uh, review article on homophily. And you'll notice here that the authors claim that homophily is the axiom that similarity breeds connection, that birds of a feather flock together, that like acts like like. Homophily generates ties between nodes, it ties the social and the geographic. And importantly, if you take this metaphor, it also grounds networks as ecological as opposed to historical, right? So the fact that we're all talking about media ecology right now, we're just discovering what is already embedded um, within network analysis itself. Um, and homophily underlies collaborative filtering, collaborative filtering groups, users, and objects into neighborhoods based on characteristics or opinions. Um, and homophily structures networks, it makes networks searchable by creating clusters. This is the key thing that it does. Um, thus the fact that network analytics produces real life echo chambers, this should surprise no one because at the heart of homophily lies a really retrograde identity politics. So homophily as grounding principle imposes or naturalizes the segregation it finds. It makes segregation the result of personal choice rather than institutional infrastructures or inequalities. Um, think, for instance, of all the assumptions that are embedded in this quotation. And one thing we have to keep in mind is that the links between homophily and segregation are deep and profound. Um, in fact, homophily was first coined in the 1950s by Lazarsfeld and Merton. Um, and in that same chapter, they also coined the term heterophily. Um, and not surprisingly, but completely erased in every reference to the work. Almost every article in network science that refers to homophily will cite this article. But what they won't bring up, or because they haven't read it, um, is that this, at the, at the heart of this notion of homophily are two cases of segregation within the United States. Right? And crucially, Lazarfeld and Merton didn't assume homophily to be a grounding principle, nor did they find homophily to be naturally present. Right. Rather, documenting both homophily and heterophily, they asked, what are the dynamic processes through which the similarity or opposition of values shape the formation, maintenance, and disruption of close friendships? Right. So homophily, and their much cited, but again, clearly unread chapter, is just one instance, one representation of friendship formation. But the current form of network science, in which homophily has moved from problem to solution, has forgotten this history. In the move from representation to model, homophily is no longer something that needs to be accounted for, but something that naturally accounts for and justifies the persistence of inequality within facially equal systems. It's become axiomatic that is common sense. Um, but homophily as a starting point cooks the ending point. Segregation is what's recovered if homophily is assumed. And further, homophily as a grounding principle imposes or naturalizes the segregation it allegedly finds. Um, consider again the evidence of the naturalness of homophily, namely residential segregation. And they point to residential segregated segregation as the most readily perceived effects of homophily. And to explain how segregation arises, um, Kleinberg and Easley um, turn to Thomas Schelling's famous model of segregation, which allegedly shows how local homophily can drive global patterns of segregation and how robust, how robust segregation is. Um, so in this model, it's a very simple model, it's X's and O's. Um, X's and O's differ according to some allegedly immutable characteristics such as race um, or ethnicity. Um, in this model, each agent wants to have at least some of its neighbors like itself, although it's willing to be a minority. So at each stage, unhappy agents are moved. Um, here you see the first move at t equals three. Um, what happens though is that integration is really hard to produce. Um, and here you see what happens at t equals four. Um, this allegedly proves that in a process not based on segregation, agents after all are willing to be in the, min in the minority, um, segregation is the most likely outcome. 
The problem, as Kleinberg can easily explain, is that from a random start, it's very hard for a collection of agents to find integrated patterns. Maybe. Um, but this model and this interpretation only works if we actively unknow the entire history of US segregation, right? There is no random starting point. Um, and the desire not to be a minority is not innocent. In fact, if you look at the history of segregation within the United States, which is one of forced segregation, the desire not to be a minority, the desire to move once your neighborhood has changed, that's white flight. Um, it's a reaction to and against desegregation. Furthermore, um, if you think about this definition, it redefines hate as love, right? What's the proof of love here? The proof you love owes is that you flee once exes arrive, right? Um, and this redefinition of hate and love is actually at the basis of, of modern redefinitions of white supremacism. Um, this model and interpretation renders invisible institutional infrastructures and responsibility, which is something that Schelling's article actually makes clear. And here you see, um, part from his now classic dynamic models of segregation, um, and it was published in 1971 in Cambridge, Massachusetts. This is during the heart of the civil rights movement and also right before you have the violent attacks around busing and desegregation in Boston. Um, and it explicitly deals with trying to understand white flight or neighborhood tipping. Um, and Schelling in his paper, as I've highlighted here, openly acknowledges that he's deliberately excluding two main processes of segregation, organized action, so all institutions, as well as economic segregation, even though he, especially as an economist, says that economic segregation might statistically explain some initial degree of separation. Um, but he doesn't explicitly refer to economics because the economic model is, is embedded within the very notion of the agent. Um, further, at the heart of this model lies immutable difference. So he says here he assumes a population exhaustively divided into two groups. Um, everyone's membership is permanent and immutable. And everyone is able to observe the number of blacks and whites that occupy a piece of territory. Now, for all sorts of reasons, these assumptions are troubling and loaded. Um, they erase the oftentimes troubling fluidity of racial identity within the United States. So during this time, during segregation, race was defined in many places through the one drop rule. So it had, it had nothing to do with visible difference. And it also assumes that everyone can move. So this model erases or unknows decades as well of scholarship in critical ethnic studies, gender, and sexuality studies, right? From Judith Butler's definitive analysis of gender performativity um, to critiques of races socially constructed, which gained widespread acceptance after the horrors of the Holocaust. And here you see just a, a collection of some of the most seminal books um, arguing for and understanding the construction of race. Um, all of this is ignored within network science when race, gender, and other differences are solidified as immutable and as no characteristics, right? So within these models is a really retrograde, pre-post-structuralist, one could even say pre-structuralist understanding of identity. Um, so what to do? So part three, heterophily, indifference, and noisy neighbors. Um, so to combat segregation, we shouldn't hide from or simply condemn network science, but instead imagine a different network science. We need to imagine new collaborations in which we work with and against network scientists to create and imagine new algorithms, new hypotheses, new grounding algorithms. New grounding algorithms infused with critical theory, infused with critical gender and sexual sexuality studies to combat that really reductive identity politics that's being perpetuated through our network algorithms. Um, so the proliferation of echo chambers and the erasure of politics isn't inevitable. We can occupy, we can transform these algorithms. We can make them self-canceling prophecies. Um, 
And although this will entail more than different network algorithms, these algorithms are a place to start. Um, so what if we took up Joanne Sison and Warren Sachs challenge to build democratic search engines? That is search engines that gave the users the most diverse rather than the most popular results. Um, what if we got the least read articles rather than the most read? Um, how would this challenge assumptions that the power law is natural, that the more the rich get richer and the poor always remain poor? Um, what if we embrace different constraints, different initial conditions? Um, and what if, rather than accepting what we're always given, and always given in the name of comfort, um, and importantly, homophilia is always justified in terms of comfort, right? You are naturally comfortable around people like you, right? which if you've ever spent any time at any family gathering, <laughs> think of the amount of alcohol you need to get through it, right? Um, <laughs> And think of the anger that emerges within segregated groups. This does not look comfortable to me, right? Um, and look at how they cite, they cite, they cite Lazarsfeld and Merton as saying that value homophily is common sense. Okay, so what if we built ties that didn't represent homophily? What would emerge if clusters represented difference rather than similarities? What if we engaged in multiple rather than bi-directional ties? What if we built networks based on mutual indifference? Right? Isn't that what a city runs on, mutual indifference? Right? What other modes of navigation and recommendation would be revealed? In fact, what's so insidious about these neighborhood models is that they assume that neighborhoods should be segregated. They assume that neighborhoods and neighbors should be like yourself. So if you manage finally to love your neighbor like yourself, it's literally because they are like yourself. Right? So this completely undoes all that you know, angst-ridden Judeo-Christian theology and moral angst of morals and ethics, right? By remodeling and reimagining who the neighbor is. Um, and what if we embedded history in these models? Um, so what you see here is Weihart's rethinking of shelling. Um, and what drives the system is desegregation. And what it real, oh, I, I, I don't even need five minutes, okay. Um, and so what this also reveals, as she notes, is um, the historical importance of initial conditions. Um, the ways that history and politics are embedded in our individual actions and habits. So what she reveals is that what matters, again, isn't disruption. Um, it isn't what's viral, but rather how things lie in wait. Um, how things lie in wait through our infrastructures, through our habits, through our default initial conditions. Um, but it also importantly though, poses us as agents. Right? It points us to the ways in which we're characters, not marionettes, in a drama we so poorly call big data. Um, so let's refuse paranoid visions that conflate propaganda with reality, um, that make these models the truth because they erase all those false positives. Right? Let's exploit and explore the noisiness of being to realize that the gap between model and reality, that is the space for political agency. Um, space to create new habits, new worlds, and new networks. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Fantastic. Um, so, absolutely. But then I'll sit down too. I will take the big one. Inequality right here. Um, so, when I hear you speak and also when I look in your book, browse through them, um, what I understand is a lot of this is all about what is being compromised, right? So what is the things that we're not taught to see? What are the things that... <laughs> Maybe they do, yeah. Um, so um, we've been taught to think about our media and our data sets, whatever, in particular languages. But how, and this is a... a bit of a zoom out question, but as you are an educator, and this is something that I'm very um, 
I think it's very important. How do we teach our students to find these compromises? So not just find a case and you know bring it to the people, but also how do you actually kind of really learn how to look at the compromises instead of you know just these little things and then explain them? Does this make sense? I think it does. Let me. Okay. Let me let me see if I'm understanding correctly, and you can tell me if I'm wrong. Um, because it strikes me as you're asking two questions. One is how do we um, educate our students about um, new media analyses to understand and to look beyond the defaults that were given. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. And then, <laughs> and then also like how do you yeah how do you teach them this basically. Well, I think, first of all, we have to realize our students are really smart. Um, and they actually do use these technologies. I think I have a couple of former students here. Are they, hi, guys. Yeah. Um, so, uh, um, so uh, <laughs> I even advised their theses or helped advise their theses. Anyway, um, so I think we have to realize that their students are really smart, but they also know um, and live with really un, um, with really bizarre contradictions with their media. So in the first uh, lecture of my course, Digital Media, I asked students how many people really, oh, let's try this here, okay. How many people here believe that Snapchat actually deletes and doesn't save any of your images? <laughs> okay, okay. Yet how many of you have sent an image in the past week that you perhaps would not want me to see? No one? <laughs> All right. So everyone here is just so smart. It makes the point. Um, but I think that going with, um, I think now, especially with Snap doing stories, things have cha changed. But I think starting with their habits and the ways in which you're already um, aware of these contradictions um, and trying to imagine differences is exactly where to start. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm giving the mic to Florian. Uh, one question. You talked about na noisy neighborhoods and, uh, let's say, the necessity of indifference um, uh, in communities. If I project this into really existing digital social networks, then I would say, oh, actually, we have a model for that. And th those are the image boards, 4chan, 8chan. They don't have any kind of network algorithms. People are not identified on them. They are anonymous. But at the same time, they're the worst breeding uh, grounds of neo-Nazism, um, the alt-right, white supremacism, etc. Isn't that uh, contradicting uh, your thesis? Because there's no homophily on the algorithmic level involved in those forms at all. We always thought of them as, as the most anarchic spaces of the internet. I think I would completely disagree with that um, description of 4chan. Um, and also, I think we have to think of homophilia not simply as based within network algorithms, but also one reason you could say it's not embedded in the network algorithm is because the, the, the kids, who, the people who go to 4chan are already self-selecting. Um, so I think we need to think of homophilia at various um, levels. And again, so the point is to th think through the relationship between the algorithmic and the societal, um, and also to realize, again, um, that it isn't suddenly um, the anarchism that somehow is the solution. I think, um, as several um, papers have brought up earlier, participation does not equal democracy. Um, in fact, if you make participation equal democracy, then you need 4chan, because you need the presence of hate online to prove that your site is really democratic, right? So we need a different way of understanding and that, that this sorting doesn't just happen there. And I wish you really would not use that word, Florian. We, we'll have a larger discussion about it, but I know for you it's about tolerance and that you can use it and then people will engage with you in a certain way, but I can't use that term and get the same engagement with people. Um, so I, I, I wish you would stop using that word. Which word? Which word? Which word? The A word. We're not using the word. And also, uh, I have to wrap it up here. So it's not going to be publicized right now. In terms of time, we're having... Sorry, thank you so much, Wendy.